Hi, I'm Declan Quigley of Adam and Alaska Shamanism. And I'm Eileen McCord, spiritual author and teacher. Today in the Nature Rob series, we'll be looking at the nature of Kundalini. Eileen, you've just published a book on Kundalini. Could you tell us more about it? Kundalini is the best kept spiritual secret for the last almost 2,000 years. Why has it been kept from us? Because there is something in there that they do not want us to know. And every other session deck we began by getting rid of material which, as I keep saying, no longer serves us on our spiritual path and replacing that with material which does serve us. And today in the Kundalini, what we've got to get out of our heads, first of all, completely out of our heads, because it does not serve us in any way on our spiritual path. The fact that we have been taught and it has been instilled deeply into us, that we need mediators or intermediaries or interceptors in order to get to God. That's what we have to get out of our heads completely. We do not need any external force, any particularly self-appointed intermediaries to get us to God. Because as we explained before, we already are the pure God essence. We don't need anybody else to get us to be what we already are. That's what we've got to get out of our heads. The power for us to reach enlightenment, the power for us, us to achieve full ascension lies within each and every one of us. And we talked about responsibility before. It is the responsibility of each one of us to reach enlightenment, to get ourselves towards enlightenment, towards full ascension. And the tool for that is the Kundalini. Kundalini is synonymous with the word God. Kundalini is the power within us. We have the power, we are the power. And the Kundalini process is, well, it's symbolized by the serpent. The serpent, the snake, as you know, sheds its scales, sheds its skin, symbolic of new life being processed. The Kundalini energy lies coiled up like a serpent at the base of our spine. And it is the process in three stages of the Kundalini awakening, the Kundalini rising, and the Kundalini full-blown explosion that gets us to ascension, gets us to enlightenment. Right? Now, the first stage is the awakening. We have got a spiritual energy lying down our spines called the Sushumni. And as the serpent awakens, it looks around you for a while, like you're getting up out of bed in the morning, certainly like me. I look around and say, what day is it? Where am I? And then I catch myself on and I begin to get into my day. The serpent awakens for a while and then it begins to rise. And as it rises, the two-headed serpent, as it rises, it rises in the figure eight, up through this Shashamni. And as it crosses over, it crosses over at seven particular points. Those are the seven chakras. In Hinduism, Shakti is the feminine energy, that's the serpent rising up, and Shiva is the masculine energy based there at the sixth chakra. And the feminine energy is rising towards the masculine to complete us as a human being. And that is called the sacred marriage. When Shakti meets Shiva at the sixth chakra, that is the sacred marriage. That is us completed as human beings, masculine and feminine merged to complete us. And when the serpent gets to there, you are ready for the full-blown explosion. And what is that full-blown explosion? That is the beginning of you being thrust into. It's not, it's not like the dying process. It's not a floating. It's a massive thrusting, a catapulting, um, what would you say, like a rocket going up. You need massive energy to get that explosion. And 
It can't be got through meditation or prayer because there's not enough energy being generated through meditation to get that catapulting movement that you need. And, you know, I only know of one person who's had the Kundalini experience. And a few other people think they've had it. But if you only think you've had it, Declan, then the answer to that is you definitely have not had it. Because you cannot have that full-blown Kundalini experience and not know you've had it. Because that catapulting, that thrusting, is like, it's a, it's a massive orgasmic movement. Some people think the Kundalini energy is the sexual energy. No, that is not correct. The sexual energy is contained within the Kundalini energy. And the sexual energy is so strong, it can create another life. So imagine how strong the Kundalini energy is. That's what creates that massive catapulting. Catapulting you into the lap of the gods, the land of the gods, where you are reaching enlightenment, where everything is open to you. All knowledge is given to you. Everything is open to you. Everything in the land of the gods is open to you. Now, let's go back to this Kundalini rising in figure eight. We mentioned there, it goes through the seven chakra systems. What's it doing as it's going through the chakras? And here again, Deb, we spoke about the story of the hero within each of us. And we spoke about the hologram. The hologram, see the hologram as God. And when you divide the hologram up into smaller pieces, each small section still contains the whole of the holographic image. So we, as a small division of God, still contain the whole of the holographic image of God within us. Now, that means that everything out there, not just the good, but the good, the bad and the ugly, is contained within each one of us. We each have the potential to be the most evil that we can be. And we have the potential to be the best we can be. We have a potential for evil and for good. It lies in our conscious or in our subconscious. Now, we cannot reach enlightenment until we empty ourselves of all that, I don't want to call it evil, but all that negativity and all that potential for negativity we have. So as the Kundalini energy is rising through the chakra systems, it is cleansing what has been amplified and magnified in us in order to be cleansed and purified to prepare us for the full-blown Kundalini. Now, in the process of this, rising and cleansing what has been amplified and magnified, we have got to face that. And here's for you as a shamanic practitioner and teacher comes in, Declan. This entails facing the gunge and the goo. And people see things, they see what they may be described as monsters or evil entities or beings. Well, what they're really seeing is what is in themselves, a projection of what's within their subconscious. And their fear of that entity is feeding them. Now, the best, I'm not saying that, well, when I say the best thing they can do is get a reputable shamanic teacher who will help them to understand what is going on and help them through this process what they're seeing. Because if we don't understand it, we fear it. And a lot of people have ended up in mental institutions because they can't deal with what they're seeing here. Now, I am not a medical practitioner. I'm not a psychiatrist, nor do I ever claim to be. I am simply saying that there are people, there must be people in mental institutions who have been going through the Kundalini process and have not understood what it really is. They have thought they're going mad. I'm not saying that going to a shamanic practitioner like you is a replacement or a substitute for medical treatment. I'm simply saying that if a person is going through the Kundalini process, then part of that is experiencing what we call the dark night of the soul. As we face these dark areas, these shadow areas of ourselves, because it's all, we contain all of these. We've got to face them and work through them. And that's what you help them do. Isn't that right, Declan? So can you tell us more about this dark night of the soul and how we deal with this? Because it is part, you're not going to escape, it is part of the Kundalini awakening and cleansing out the gunge and the goo in our chakras, which is definitely there. Well, that's a fundamental part of anyone's spiritual path. 
anyone's spiritual arising. Now, the dark night of the soul is those times of crises in, mm -hmm. in our lives that we that we come across every now and again. And we all have. We have to face them, Declan. We all have to face them, and it is exactly that. It is the release of negative energy. It is the release, in fact, of the ego. So we must experience a dark night of the soul at some time on our spiritual path. In the, on the shamanic path, you tend to find that quite a bit. That you come across this and you experience this balance and checks that uh, is in our natural spiritual energy. That the ego must be removed. For instance, if you become too fixated on money, materialism, those those negative energies must be purged away, and that is what the the dark night of the soul is. And we can experience many dark nights of the soul, Absolutely. can't we, Declan? Because it's this purging, as you say, and this purge is necessary to prepare us for enlighten enlightenment. We can't be enlightened unless we're purged from all of this, as I call, gunge and goo, either in our conscious or in our subconscious. And it's about the energy rising and coming to the point uh, where you have some of this gunge or this goo. For instance, for me, um, in a recent class I did with you, Ellie, I... Uh, found that the kundalini energy rose until it got to the throat chakra. Now, it stopped at the throat chakra for me, I believe, because in my experience, in my childhood growing up, I didn't have a voice. And the throat chakra is all about expressing yourself. It's all about speaking your truth. Right. So the kundalini energy stopped here in me because I have blockages here. Okay. And that's something that I will work on in this lifetime and, and perhaps the next lifetime. Everyone else that day, Declan, as we were doing the attunement, experienced something in a different chakra. But you were at the throat, yes. <laughs> Does that mean, Declan, that you're, that you're almost ready for this? I think that is something that I need to work on. Okay. Um, and it could take a lifetime, it could take yeah. several lifetimes yes. to clear out that particular right. negative energy. Right. That's right. This Kundalini is not something that happens quickly. It can take a lifetime. It does take a lifetime after a lifetime after a lifetime. Simply because the chakras are not just seven single units. There are a thousand petals of the lotus in that one. There are 96 in this and so on. There, there, is a, there are dimensions on dimensions, worlds within worlds within each chakra. And to get one chakra cleared could take many, many lifetimes. That's what we come back for. And again, we're back to the one story, as we spoke about before. The story of the hero within each of us. The hero story. The hero story. Facing our darker nature and coming out into enlightenment. And where in the fairy tales that happens overnight, it doesn't happen overnight with us. It takes lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Um, and remember, it's, it's there in all the novels, it's all the literature, it's the fairy tales. William Butler Yeats, Wandering Ingus, is taken from the myth. Ingus, one, he sees a beautiful woman in his dreams and he keeps following, 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 trying to find her and every time he reaches up with her she changes form and turns into something else. And he spends his whole lifetime looking for her. And the end he realises what he was looking for was really within himself all along. So we have it in the fairy tales, we have the story of the hero in myths and legends and as we said last week, we have it in the story of Jesus in the Gospels. Absolutely. And I think any story any story at all has some element of that in it, a hero's journey, mm -hmm. um, where the hero sets out, realises challenges, experiences challenges, and, and comes to a better state of awakening mm -hmm. or rising, and ultimately one's out in the end. The story of, in our, our own mythology, the story of Cahillan, yes, and the story of Lou. All those stories are a series of challenges and experiences to get to the end result, which is ultimately an awakening. Kundalini awakening, yes. And the same with Jesus in the canonical Gospels. The story based around Jesus come from the mythology and astrological, as we saw last week. The story of Jesus, when he's dying on the cross, as they have in the Gospels, um, he's dying, he has no energy, his body he can't breathe, and he gasps out in the last words, a great cry. Well, there was the explosive movement explosion that gets him into, he's going into the next dimension. 
Now let's talk about when you go through that explosion, there's no way back. One way, one way ticket in that one. And you are still in this life, in this physical existence, but you are connected to all that is and everything is exposed to you, everything is open to you, you have all this knowledge. You have access to everything, you are everything. I am you, I am that person's thoughts. It's very hard to decipher between which is your thoughts and which is that person's. And as I said, there's no way back. You are actually living two lives. You're 95% in the spirit world and you're 5% here. And to everybody around you, you seem to be living a normal existence, but you're not. How can you be when you're 95% there and only 5% here? And when you're exposed to all this knowledge, for example, people can't lie to you because you're reading their thoughts as if you were spirit. You go to the shop and maybe somebody's standing there, you're surrounded by entities who need help. Who do you know? How do you know which is? There's all this exposed to you. But as long as you understand what it is, I think that reduces the fear because fear, well, all this kind of stuff feeds off fear. The negative, negativity feeds off fear. That's why I say that if you understand the Kundalini process, it will certainly help you in dealing with it because each one of us has at some stage in some lifetime to go through the Kundalini process. There's no escape. So would you say then that the Kundalini experience is us getting back into the oneness? Yes. Yes, definitely. Getting on to ending. When you have the Kundalini experience, that signifies your last lifetime here in this physical dimension. You're off the wheel of reincarnation. You're on to the Antikrana Bridge to get over into the next, and you start another series of, as we spoke about the last day. It goes on and on and on and on. So Declan, can we sum up what we've said today about the Kundalini? We've said, first of all, that we've got to get out of our heads the fact that we need intermediaries to get us to our enlightenment, to get us to ascension. We said that we have the power within each of us, we are the power, and that power is the Kundalini God energy. And the rising of the Kundalini energy through our chakra systems is the story of the here within each of us. Throwing up the gunge and the goo that's in our shadow areas, that's in our unconscious, that's what's got to be emptied and cleared out before we can reach enlightenment. Getting rid of that in order to get into the process, to complete the process of enlightenment. And then that starts us on our next cycle in the spirit world. So, Ellen, um, what will we be talking about next week? Next week, Declan, we're going to be going back to the Gospels again. And we're going to be talking about the symbolism of the Gospels. Because the word Kundalini, if you take out of the Gospels the word Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Father, you take that out and replace it with the word Kundalini, then you have cracked the code of the symbolism of the Gospels. And that's what we're talking about next week, the symbolism of the Gospels. Because we said, yes, they're mythological stories, but myths were stories that had symbolism in them. And we have got to find the moral or the lesson they're trying to teach us. So next week is about the symbolism of the Gospels. And finding Kundalini in that symbolism, because it's all about Kundalini. The secret that has been kept from us for the last almost 2,000 years in order to control us. We hope you'll join us again next week. And until we meet again, namaste. Thanks for watching. Namaste.